Hello there, and welcome to uh, uh, fourth in a series, Build a Course series, provided by the instructional design team at UAF eLearning. Uh, today we're going to talk about assessments and measurement. Uh, with me today, uh, I have Chris Lott, Kendall Newman Sadik, uh, <laughs> Madeira Mason, and our Leader today is Owen Guthrie. Great. Thanks, Heidi. Um, I, I just wanted to say uh, briefly, uh, thanks especially to my colleagues who are here to join us today. I, I don't know what our viewing audience is like, but um, it, having a conversation with live people is going to be uh, a lot better than me narrating for the next two and a half hours, which is the amount of content I have to cover. No, I, I'm just kidding. I hope, to, I hope that we can uh, have a, a, a rich and interesting conversation on the subject of assessment and measurement. It's a subject that I think is um, often completely overlooked in education. Uh, I know I didn't think about it at all until maybe starting maybe four or five years ago. And once you start to scratch the surface, it seems it continues to grow deeper and deeper and more complicated. And I think I know less now than I have ever known about the topic. But I can share with you some of my uh, musings and, and, and um, discoveries and ideas, and hopefully we'll have a good conversation today. Um, so let's see. So I'm going to share my screen. Before and, and while you're doing that, Owen, yes. uh, Marika has a question about just oh. wanting to be in the right place, and she certainly is. Um, uh, if you are also viewing and have questions, for Owen or the rest of the team, then there's a Q&A function within the Hangout. So please ask questions. I'm going to be monitoring them, and we'll break in when I can um, and bring them up to um, our, uh, everyone's attention. And this is a great way to have a conversation. Thanks, Heidi. OK, so effective assessment and measurement. Um, this is me, and uh, you can find the slides on the, on the Google Plus event page. There's a short link to my slide presentation. You can follow along. Uh, by pulling them up, or you can just watch as I talk through them. Um, you don't need to pull them up now, but they're available later if you like. Um, this is the fourth of fifth five uh, Hangouts on Air on the subject of building a course. And um, we've already covered quite a bit of ground, and I encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to go back and, and look over some of the, the presentations that have uh, gone by. And we have one final one coming up uh, next week on uh, course tools and technology. Today, however, we're going to talk a little bit about assessment. And I just wanted to start briefly with the question um, that is simply, what is assessment? And uh, I can have my colleagues take a stab at that one. Um, and you can be my foil, or I can bumble along and give you my idea. Thoughts? Multiple choice tests. <laughs> Multiple choice tests, awesome. Yeah, so I, I think, I mean, I, I think generally assessment, everybody has some idea. That somehow you're trying to measure something or gather information about what students know. Um, I think that's, that's sort of the, the basic instinct behind what assessment is all about. Um, final exams multiple choice tests, quizzes, papers, all of that stuff. The stuff we have students do to demonstrate something. And usually, um, what they're demonstrating, hopefully, is understanding. Um, and that is where I start to fall off the deep end into this uh, sort of abyss of complexity. Because understanding is such a complicated thing in the human experience. You know, I hate to be one of those people who says, oh, this, this subject we're talking about today is the most amazing and most complicated subject that has ever been considered by mankind. But I think understanding has got to be right up in there um, as, as sort of nearly unfathomable. Um, this is the Milky Way, of course. There's literally 100 billion neurons in your brain and 100 trillion potential connections. That's related to understanding in its complexity. I'm not sure exactly uh, how, but... Um, I think that just starts to maybe shine a glimmer on how every person's understanding and perception and learning is a unique experience. So no, we're not going to quantify understanding clearly at any one time. That's just not going to happen. Instead, what we use are um, 
these indirect indicators of understanding surrogates, right? We're not, we can't really get at the real thing very often, sadly, um, if ever. Um, but I just want to take a brief aside to poke some pedagogical fun at uh, our friends, the Taliban. Um, I'm using them as my, my foil in the moment, just to kind of make fun of their pedagogy. Um, they uh, rely heavily on rote memorization of chapter and verse of the Quran, which, you know, uh, is fairly low on Bloom's taxonomy, I think. And I think, sadly, that that's where their, um, that's where their pedagogy ends. Um, and maybe, just maybe, they'd be better off if they took their students to a higher level and considered some of these higher learning level outcomes or more complex or deep understandings. Just to remind you, uh, Heidi went over um, taxonomies of learning uh, a couple of talks ago. I think it was the first one in our series. Um, and so this is Bloom's taxonomy and Webb's depth of knowledge. There's, uh, with these different taxonomic levels, there's a series of appropriate verbs you might use to describe your hope for learning understandings or your hope for outcomes. Um, and we talked a little bit about six facets. Again, this is a little bit, it's maybe not so hierarchical, although there is some implicit hierarchy on this one. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, rather than just remember if maybe the Taliban could take us, take their pupils to a place of empathy or perspective or even self-knowledge, the world might be a different place. And that's also true for Fink's taxonomy. This is my favorite taxonomy of understanding and learning. Um, there's slightly nuanced difference, but imagine, if you will, most of the Taliban's uh, these very low-level remember, recite, repeat is in the foundational knowledge and that sort of one, or 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock pie wedge and how great the world might be or how much better off we might be if there was more in the human dimension in the schools of the Taliban or perhaps caring and feelings and interests. So. It's my little dig at the Taliban. So they're very low level. This is a, uh, just a quick chart of some measurable learning objectives from my personal course. Um, just to, to sort of briefly illustrate that in a, in a rich course, we hope for a complexity of learning objectives or a complexity of outcomes that address a variety of sort of cognitive processes or experiences, um, things like apply, discuss, evaluate, um, describe, debate, those kinds of objectives are much more rich than simple remember and recite. But we have to take a look at ourselves too and think about where we come from, what's our past in uh, with, with pedagogy and our past for these learning outcomes. And actually the origin of recitation sections, which are pretty common on most campus, is literally that same origin where you would sit before a, a wizened sage and be lectured to, and then you'd go speak to a lesser student and recite what you learned, literally verbatim recitation of the, the lessons learned from that event. So that's actually, I think, on a way, you know, people go to a fancy college and they, they say, well, I've got this great faculty member and I've, I've, then I've got this recitation section where we discuss or, or whatever, but oftentimes um, the roots of that are in a much lower level. Uh, activity. So I think it's important to consider why we're assessing uh, in order to get at what what your structure is, what your design is going to be. And so I just wanted to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about why you're assessing and feel free to jump in anytime, folks. Um, but the question arose to me, uh, do I really care about student understanding and am I really trying to assess it? Um, because at first glance, you think, oh, of course, that's, that's what we want. We want student understanding. Um, that's all, that's all, all of our goals here at, at an institution of higher learning. We're hoping for, you know, all of our students are going to go marching forth in the world with this great level of understanding. But in fact, well, let's start with the definition here. Um, and I'm uh, using my slides in a way that I don't usually. Usually I can see the next slide coming up. So there might be some rocky transitions. So just be warned. Um, so this is a simple definition. Assessment is the process of gathering and discussing information from multiple and diverse sources in order to develop a deep understanding of what students know, understanding, can do with their knowledge. As a result of their educational experiences, the process culminates when assessment results are used to improve subsequent learning. 
That is a really powerful definition, I think, that takes just a moment to think about the idea that assessment has purpose not only for the student, but also for subsequent students. In other words, you're, you're assessing not only their learning, but also, in general, your students' learning and how might you improve your teaching or your practice so that um, their learning outcomes are improved. Another definition, um, assessment is a syst systematic basis for making inferences about the learning and development of students. It's a process of defining, selecting, designing, collecting, analyzing, interpreting, and using information to increase students' learning and development. It's Whenever they use a whole bunch of verbs to describe something, it's, you know, it's just like this basket of all these things we do in education we call assessment. Um, and that with a lot of different purposes and sort of oftentimes not a lot of thought. So that's sort of a general framework. So back to the question of why are you assessing? Um, and that's wrapped up in these two definitions. Are you assessing for yourself or for your students or probably both? Um, and there's sort of two different kinds of assessment or two, maybe two ends of a spectrum. Um, formative assessment is something that is generally more for the student. Uh, it's helping them on their process, um, giving them feedback as they're learning and guiding their understandings. It's ongoing and students often are checking in repeatedly. Summative assessment at the other end of the spectrum is um, really these capstone or snapshot measurements of student competency. Often they're sort of gateway uh, moments, final exams, midterms. You either make it or you don't uh, in sort of weeder courses um, or, or weeder experiences. And they're usually very tightly tied to some sort of um, numeric accounting of understanding, whereas feedback may not be. So there's a sort of matrix of understandings, uh, oh, sorry, of assessments um, between the formative and summative and individual and group. And this is a, an interesting diagram that resonated with me, um, that your object of your assessment may be different, your purpose is different, and your level. And so that you get this sort of complicated um, three-dimensional space in which assessment occurs and all of us, each of us in our courses, exist at multiple points within this space at a given time. Um, I like this idea of learner-centered assessment, the idea that, going back to that definition, where you're assessing or should be thinking about what effect your assessment has on your process, um, not just them, but how you're helping the student learn through your assessment. So this is a formative feedback cycle. And, and interestingly, at the top, um, oh, on the, it's on the far left-hand side, discuss and use assessment results to improve learning. There's that piece again that you're going to use these results to improve student learning both for them and also in your design. And this is where I'm going to open it up a little bit more to hopefully some of my colleagues here will have some comments. Um, systems of assessment. We have this crazy scheme where we have a four-point scale. It's really a hundred-point scale because it's really a decimal scale that somehow converts back and forth to a five-point letter scale with minuses and pluses that's derived from a another hundred-point scale. And, you know, if we're trying to quantify understanding, somewhere in there we're going to mix in things like attendance and tardiness and punctuation in addition to maybe students specific content knowledge. So it's this, this great aggregate of crude perception of understanding that then gets distilled into a number that maybe then translated into a letter grade that's then back and forth translated into this, you know, three point whatever. Whoever said to anyone, oh, my GPA is 1.89, as if though that matters. Um, it obviously doesn't. So really, we use a very small segment of the number scale. It's really like 3.0 and above that people care about what the second part of the decimal is. Um, and it's, so it's, it, I think it's really worthwhile thinking about that, um, how we abstract understandings into these things. And I know uh, I've worked extensively with a faculty member here on campus who pretty much has distilled things down to A, C, and F. In other words, excellent 
meets expectations or a C and fails expectations. And I think there's some real wisdom there, potentially, to think about being purposeful in your design for what you really know about their understanding and what you're really trying to communicate with them. Um, I think, I think, for me, uh, in a perfect world, under assessment is is a is is a bit of a dialogue or a conversation between the uh, between you as the instructor and the student, and when you get too far away from clear communication, uh, it starts to, the system starts to break down, trust breaks down, you start to need a hefty syllabus. But the more you are interacting with the student, that's the, that's the ancient root, right? In a perfect world, we would sit and work with our students on a daily basis, and everyone would have a very close and intimate understanding of, or intimate perception of their understanding. There wouldn't be a need for distilling that down into some sort of grade. Um, there are other systems, of course, pass-fail, uh, competency-based assessment. Um, we have a faculty member here on campus who used an upside-down based or a game-based type assessment, whereas you start the course with effectively zero points. Everyone starts at the same pl place, and every assignment that you turn in, uh, you gain points. So there's no subtractive type math in your assessment. If if you simply want to do better, you simply do more. You do another assignment, even if you did maybe one at a half level of uh, you know, demonstrating your expertise, you could do another one and potentially earn some more points there. Um, so those are some questions. And that leads to sort of this, this larger question of where do we come from as instructors? Uh, what is our culture? Because we bring a lot of expectations and assumptions to the classroom. Uh, when it comes to assessment, we, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with faculty members and, and experienced as a student myself where I clear, clearly the instructor is using an assessment tool without being purposeful in what they're actually trying to derive from that. Um, so are we the assessment Taliban? So I thought it might be interesting to have a couple of case studies and, and um, help out, please, uh, experts in the online audience here. Um, so, so Owen, before yes, you get started there, maybe yes. we can have some input from the gallery here because Great. I am, you know, you presented, you are presenting this from the instructor's perspective on how they are assessing and how they are implementing that assessment, whether for themselves or students. But I'm also interested, or just want to throw out there, the conditioning and conditioned response about the way we're presenting that to students or not and what expectations they come in with for assessment models and maybe dealing with that, whether they're you know, incoming students who are conditioned in a certain way with high school um, or whether they're coming from whatever perspective they are uh, because that can be a heavy tension with different ways of teaching. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I, I, I'm sort of um, framing these sort of antiquated cultures of assessment on behalf of the instructor, but you're right, sometimes when you shift that up on students, they can feel uncomfortable if you want to have a lot of conversations with them about their work, or if you have maybe less rigid systems or structured systems um, for assessing, um, that they, they just simply want to know that they get a 93 or 95, or they're used to our haggling about points, and you're not caring about points. You're saying, no, I, I don't know exactly what point that is, but to me, it's effectively a C because it doesn't meet my expect, doesn't exceed my expectations. So you're right. There, are, there are these cultures, and, and I think being upfront and explicit with students, having this conversation at the beginning of the semester about what you're expecting of them, that's a way to address that. Any other thoughts on that? I I just find myself persistently coming back to the idea of the value of failure and how that plays a role in assessment and how the cultures of assessment right now in both high school and higher education um, really don't allow a lot of room for that. I mean, as somebody who's a, a student of the arts, there's been no better teacher for me than failure. Um, and it's interesting that uh, slide that you have and the slide 25, um, it's got those uh, those matrices, the program enhancement and the campus and program evaluation. Um, I Often when I'm thinking about assessment and talking about assessment, I tend to approach it solely from the the teacher's point of view, um, right. thinking about, okay, are my students getting it? How can I adjust my teaching so that they get it? But then faculty always remind me that they're under a tremendous amount of pressure to prove 
via their assessments that they're doing a certain kind of job, that they're um, achieving a certain kind of success, and that the real assessment that they actually want to engage in is that it doesn't match up with, with what's being asked of them from the institution. Um, and that's an interesting tension to me, and it's interesting to think about how we can provide people with solutions to, to work within those two extremes and figure out how to do what's best for the students while also representing their discipline well. Um, I don't know, there's just, a, I think there's a, a lot of tension here that um, it's easy to talk about the ideal and, and easy to overlook some of the, the problems. I think that's a really good point. And I, I noticed in the chat while I was blathering on at my slides, I noticed some a couple good points were raised too. Um, there is, I, I don't mean to denigrate the importance of memorization. Memorization is the foundation of a, a lot of learning. You have to know the periodic table. You have to know, um, you know, the times tables. Uh, there's a lot of things that are that are quite important um, that can only be memorized. It's just they don't stick in your head any other way. Uh, we had an I teach recently, and we we had an interesting exchange amongst faculty about the, all the different mnemonics that they remembered from their college days, and there are hundreds of crazy mnemonics out there. You, you have a field, there are these people come with different ones. The one I happen to remember from geology was come over some day, maybe play poker three kings, cover two jacks. It's a weird geology mnemonic. There are music mnemonic, there's, and there's really, just goes to show that there are these things to, to gain, um, to carry around these little bits of information that have no other way of sticking in your head other than rote memorization. That's how we access them, and that's the only way we can deal with them. Um, so, and and you and you're both right. I think in that that gets to what I was saying about the more you dig into assessment, it's such a complicated thing. And the, you know, it's easiest as a one-to-one -one conversation. It gets really hard when classes get big, schedules get tight, and uh, you're you're there's a lot of content flowing, and you have to at the end of the day figure out a way to to rubber meets the road, make it work. Um, so maybe we can jump to a couple examples now. Thank you for interrupting. Please do so again. I really appreciate that. I'm going to share my screen again here, if I can. Also, this is sort of a, at a meta level. This is demonstrating some uh, some synchronous presentation techniques, uh, best practices and worst practices, perhaps. Uh, my colleagues had this great chat going in the uh, Hangout, but I was looking at my slide presentation, which doesn't. So, and I'll probably have to go back there now. So, anyway, so here's my slides. Um, so, I want to talk briefly, and, and I thought it might be interesting for our listeners to hear us sort of brainstorm on some courses. And here's a few that that have already, we've already been through, um, but then we can move on to some that we haven't. Um, so, Biology 115, 116. I had a meeting with a, a couple of faculty, um, Diane and Kristen O'Briens, um, Diane O'Brien and Kristen O'Brien, um, here on campus. And they were they came to us to talk a little bit about uh, assessment in face-to-face -face biology course majors, um, which is great. That's something we love to talk about and work with faculty on. Um, and biology comes from a very strong, what I would call a summative tradition, right? There's not a lot of formative feedback in your standard freshman biology course. It's mi it's multiple choice, midterm, final, um, and maybe a little bit of formative stuff in a lab course, but basically it's summative. So we started talking and they're using the clickers in class on a daily basis and, I, and we started talking about, well, that's, you know, that's a formative, depending upon how you use that, um, you can have some pretty formative effect on student learning. If you use it, say, requiring students to come to class read and you, you know, having read the readings and you're going to have a, a little quiz every morning, um, I, that can be a pretty powerful tool. So just shifting it slightly to incorporate some of these formative tools might have a great effect on student learning as opposed to these sort of, you know, you're on your own, I'm lecturing for seven weeks, and then there's going to be this, you know, study cram for the midterm. It's a 50-point multiple choice midterm, and uh, let's hope you make it. You know, instead of checking in on a daily basis with your students, that's a kind of a, a formative uh, element there. Do you guys have any thoughts on, on that course or others? Um, I can... In, in this regard before I jump to Abel's course? I think there, especially in a uh, low, uh, 100 level class like this where there is a lot of content that 
that um, daily sort of uh, check-in with yourself as a student and the learning is really important. And um, I mean, I, I think it's been proven that cramming isn't going to um, get, you know, if you're going on to the next level, cramming's not the way to do it. You need to keep at it every day, make reading notes, um, ask yourself questions and then answer them. Um, perhaps even writing it down so that you're sort of making a commitment to that answer. I, th I think that's really important in that level of course and trying to, you know, be facilitating that as an instructor um, is really helpful, especially at the beginning and until you get students sort of into that um, into that routine and yeah, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> well, th th I think that that's well said and this, this idea is not my own. It came to me from a paper that I found when doing some research for writing a teaching tip uh, a while ago from a research study from Florida, I think. And the authors, uh, it's a pretty famous uh, paper about um, test taking. And basically the more frequent you put in, a, in sort of the testing stress and the more um, cumulative they are, the better your learning outcomes. It's, it's not really that rocket science if you think about, oh, okay, if you're asking people to, to demonstrate their understanding on a daily basis and you're asking them to do it again and again, surprise, they learn better. Um, but what was interesting in that study is that the at-risk students perform not only better in, in the course that they were surveying, but in the other, their other courses as well. In other words, they were just basically getting um, coerced into some adoption of some better study habits, which is interesting. Um, there, there's also the aspect that the mechanism of assessment can be uh, achieving other purposes. So frequent kind of assessments and lightweight assessments. Also, you know, there's a lot of research about engagement, that simple engagement without any qualification of what that engagement is with the instructor, with the students, with the materials, uh, leads to you know, significantly improve retention and performance. So if nothing else, you're, especially in the online environment, you're bringing people back around constantly. It may have nothing to do with the outcome of the assessments, and they may not matter at all that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can have the, the layered purposes in this very complicated world you're playing in with those. I think that's, that's a great example. So I'm just going to jump into, without jumping back to the slide, because all it says is Biology 043, Rethinking Quizzes. We don't really need to go to the slide to, to hear that. Abel's course, uh, we worked with Dr. Abel Boltito here on campus to develop an online course for, it's a lab-based course, and he really wanted the students to know um, a certain amount of content, or to master it, if you will, before moving on to the next segment. So his idea was, well, I would just give them a quiz. And then he started thinking about how many quizzes that would be, and it got to be this really burdensome load, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to be grading quizzes all the time. Even auto-graded quizzes is going to generate, he's going to got to worry about point schemes and how much points is this one worth versus, versus that one. And so we sort of had the eureka moment where we said, well, we don't really want them to not know any of it. We really want them to know all of it. Why not just make the, the quizzes so that you can't proceed until you know everything? You get the, the two or three questions correct. Um, that's a different assessment idea, I think. It's this notion that um, you're not really interested in some sort of scale, you're really interested in mastery, and that's what that's the game for your students. Um, I haven't seen other examples of that on campus, but I'm sure there are some. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. Uh, the next example I was thinking about is in, in the composition courses, and I'm hoping Kendall and Madera particularly can contribute some wisdom here. I think. English, especially composition, and this is me speaking from a place of com near complete ignorance, so school me as you can, um, has a pretty strong formative tradition, right? The edit drafts and, and working through um, the revision cycle with students. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that works? And also, uh, we can open up the, the conversation to include your objections to or at least some overjections I've overheard to the um, five-paragraph essay, and why? Kendall, I think you should try to field this one, this one first. I think you've actually got some interesting thoughts on on this matter. Okay. Hi. Um, the five-paragraph essay, different. And yeah, what I mean I, there, I, I can give you my. So I'm not trying to leave yeah. you blind. But what I was thinking about there is, I think the five-paragraph essay, the, and the reason why many people object to it is. It's, it's a 
you're assessing structure and the idea is we're, we're so interested in fostering critical thinking and analysis and ideas and yet we're assessing some sort of structural component. That's where there's this sort of disharmony, at least in my mind. Um, anyway, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think I find the five paragraph essay to be pretty prescriptive and once a student figures it out, um, like figures out the problem of the five paragraph essay, they can perform it pretty well. Um, and I guess... And it's not to say that, that being able to do that isn't a good thing. Right. But there are other things. <laughs> there are, are other things, important. right. Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. Think, I think students making choices about, um, and with awareness of audience and content, what they're trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, the five paragraph essay is not always appropriate. And oftentimes, actually, if you're thinking about students writing outside of academia, the five paragraph essay is not appropriate. And so having them think more about um, and assi creating assignments that really aren't five paragraph essay assignments mm -hmm. that really don't ask for a five paragraph essay answer. Um, so assignments, for example, um, like to write an op-ed for the Daily News Miner. Um, and that forces students to think about the audience they're writing for. Um, it forces them to think about the choices they make in relationship to that audience and also uh, where that will where that will appear um, what they're trying to accomplish and so it actually calls on them to assess the rhetorical situation um, that I think the five paragraph essay doesn't as much there's a rhetorical uh, situation assumed so it, it gives you this opportunity by using other um, avenues of expression of understanding, you can ask them to broaden their demonstration, right? If, if you stick them in this one sort of box, this is, this is the medium of expression, uh, it's confining. Yeah. And as, as Mr. Lott says, anemic, which I like that word. <laughs> um, I think too, having, um, Midair, your mic's off. Um, I think it was a little <laughs> pop-up actually, it was like, hey, your, your mic's off. Um, I think too, having assignments like uh, writing assignments that appear in public places or assignments where you specify an audience. Um, but, you know, like assignments that appear in public places can also be really interesting when it comes to assessment when you think about actually who is reading that. Um, and in my experience, students uh, have been really motivated by creating things that they do actually send into the news miner and that they do post on Wikipedia or that really do get public attention. Um, and then you're creating an assignment that is not driven only toward assessment, right, and only toward the grade. There's something else that students are looking for. I, right. I think it's worth bringing up uh, the job of the composition uh, instructor as it stands right now, especially at this university. One of the goals of something like 111 and 211 is not really just teaching someone how to write. That's a big, broad issue. But those courses are specifically structured to teach students how to write in an academic context. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting problem because what that means is that I'm asking students to learn how to write in a form that's acceptable to people who learned the form 10, 15, 20, sometimes 30 and 40 years ago. Um, and so their expectations are that students will write a certain way. And so it's a little bit difficult, I think, to break out of that that mode of, of the very anemic five paragraph essay because that's what other professors expect students to know how to do. So if you don't teach them how to do that and they go into a science course or a biology course or you know even a math course where they're asked to write something even as simple as one paragraph, those professors who are assessing the writing have a certain expectation that students are going to write a particular way and they won't be assessed well if they're not able to write that way. So even though it's sort of like you want to push them outside of the, the boundaries of tradition and ask them to write for real audiences, but that's, it's tricky, you know, you can't completely ignore the tradition because that's what students need to be able to produce for other courses. Right. Um, right. So yeah, it's a big job. It's At a big job time, for classes to do. Right, and, and, and that gets back to that being purposeful, like for instance as an instructor, if you know you need to prepare students for success in these other courses, you have to include that. At the same time, you want to prepare them to be effective in other venues in their upcoming life, so that's a different type of assessment. So if you just hammer them with five five paragraph essays. So I think we've beaten that to death. To, to beat it potentially just a little bit more, 
I did have a couple of slides on the topic. Um, but thank you both for that inside view because that's not my my thing really. But I will I will continue to try. So um, why not the five paragraph essay? So I've recently stumbled upon this gentleman named Frank Idelot. Uh, he's some sort of a hero of mine. Um, he was an early Rhodes Scholar right around the turn of the 19th century. Um, went to Oxford for a while, came back and decided to teach English at Indiana University in like 1906, 1910, so right in there, early, early uh, 1900s. And uh, they basically kicked him out of Indiana University because he, he wasn't teaching, uh, this is a crude generalization and Chris will correct me because he knows better than I, but essentially the five paragraph essay, he was focused on structure instead of, I'm sorry, he was focused on content instead of structure. And they wanted structure, and he was trying to revolutionize, and he came up with this idea called the think method, or, or writing via the think method. And uh, finally, he just, the Indiana was too conservative, and he moved on to MIT, and eventually ended up at Swarthmore, where he eventually created the Swarthmore Honors Program, based a little bit on the Oxford model. Um, but the system, I'll just read the quote, um, the system is based on the premise that the only true education is self-education. The idea was to create a set of similar seminar courses for selected students that were more challenging than the regular curriculum. These students would not receive grades or examinations, but would receive oral examinations at the end of their senior year given by external examiners. Replace the lecture method of teaching for the advanced students. Introduce the notion of students reaching the faculty. The method of teaching has become the signature of a Swarthmore College education. I thought that was interesting because um, it gets back to sort of this depth of displaying understanding. Obviously, we can't afford that. That's a very expensive model. Um, but we might be able to include parts of it uh, and improve our connection and the, the, the richness of that conversation, the assessment conversation with our students. Obviously, if you have a lecture hall with 400 students, that's a challenge. Um, but I thought that was interesting that effectively, this pedagogical innovation with regard to assessment set him up uh, to create some great thinkers and eventually you know he, he ran the Institute for Advanced Study with and during the war where he had Einstein and Goodell and John von Neumann and you know he was selected as as this person who was renowned have as being able to um, get the most out of these great thinkers. And in the 30s as he was on the cover of Time magazine he was allegedly going to revolutionize higher education in America. Um, these ideas, but uh, that's the subtext there, basically. Uh, but of course, we know that didn't happen everywhere, and and so where do we exist on this uh, complicated landscape? Um, there's sort of a buzzword, authentic assessment, but I hope that the listeners will uh, follow me along. And project-based learning is often can be very effective. Um, this is a course we put together, HLRM 170's Health Issues in Alaskan Ungulates, where the students are generally rural students in Alaska. And the goal is to get them to where they can perform a field necropsy. Uh, they have to understand anatomy and field co sample collection techniques. And um, after the end of this two credit course, the idea is uh, they would be able to send samples to a regulatory agency for their uh, ungulate herds. Um, so we just decided, well, why not, as the final exam, have them perform a necropsy? Because that's what we want them to be able to demonstrate they understand how to do. Um, so that's, I guess, the authentic piece. Why not just have them do the thing we want them to demonstrate? And it's a project-based learning, which is also has some rich opportunities. So I'm not going to show the video, but the student put together, it's on the slide here, uh, for those who want to watch it later, a fantastic video where they butcher and necropsy uh, one of their own uh, flightless ducks, and it's really, really well done. And I think, you know, for a two-credit course, the student put together a fantastic presentation and clearly demonstrated her understanding of the of the material. Um, um, I have to go. Oh, okay, so I just sure. wanted to throw in a couple quick things here. One one aspect of assessment too to consider is, I mean, at a certain level and and kind of course, you have more ability to be promoting what I would get, I guess you could say, an authentic kind of self-assessment on the part of the students themselves. And I don't mean traditional, self easy self-assessment, but the kind of rich self-assessment that comes out of the kind of models that you're really talking about here, which is the studio model and the apprenticeship model. And, you know, we don't have the luxury of that in scaling for the institution. 
but I think there are places where we can carve out spaces to let those kinds of activities happen where the, the, the assessment is in the doing and the real assessment that matters is the metacognition, the meta thinking by the students themselves and how you facilitate that, which is way beyond what you can actually assess in any student yourself, no matter how well you know the subject. Yep. So just something to throw out there. That's I great. Know. Okay, super. Thank you for joining us. Yep. So back to the slides here from what I had a, actually someone uh, coincidentally sent this slide to me, or sent this video to me last night. Uh, it's a older, it's a few years old, and I don't want to, I'm not casting aspersions on Dr. Quinn, or Professor Quinn, um, but I think his, his conundrum brings up a lot of interesting assessment and pedagogical challenges. Uh, just a bit of backstory here. Um, he teaches a 600 person lecture course uh, using an exam, from an, using questions from an exam pool of 700 questions. The students, it's a midterm, they're given 50 of those questions. And here, here's, what, here's what happened. He discovers there's cheating in his course. I'm going to skip it forward just a little bit, hopefully. And unfortunately, I think some of you know, uh, I've been here for 11 years. I spent 10 years before I came here at the Rochester Institute of Technology. So I've been doing this for the last 21 plus years. Uh, probably delivered course content to tens of thousands of students over those 21 years. And it was always one lecture that I hoped I never would have to give. Unfortunately, that hope ran out. I'm going to give a lecture today that basically is the toughest one I've ever had to give. For some of you, it's the toughest one you've ever had to hear. When the midterm exam ended on Friday a week ago, uh, I looked at the data from the midterm exam, and uh, at first I was just looking at the running statistics for the exam, and the exam was running about a grade and a half higher than it ever had run before. And that was rather interesting. Uh, it kind of set up a little bit of a red flag, because 600 some odd students uh, basically course them about fundamentally the same way for the last four or five years. Uh, you don't see that kind of a great improvement uh, by chance. Once the exam ended, I ran more uh, complete statistics on the exam. And what I came up with, and what, what came out of that. Okay. So I'm going to jump, I'm going to unshare my, unshare my screen here. If it'll let me, there we go. I, so uh, he goes on to say, uh, basically, um, this 700 question pool, 50 questions, and the pool leaked. Someone actually turned him in a Xerox, pay, a Xerox big thick packet of all the questions. And so he's seeing this as this great violation of confidentiality, which, I mean, it is if, if he's not expecting that to be released. Uh, what do you guys think about that pedagogically? I mean, it's, it's such an interesting thing. So anyway, he, keeps, he goes on to talk quite a bit about the analysis. They're going to hire forensic analysts. They're going to look at the statistics behind each student's responses and try and determine who, you know, who, who's, who's, who was in the know and who wasn't based on the likelihood and, and develop this list of 200 students. They figure about a, thir 30, a third of them or so were cheating. So, Owen, don't you think to a certain extent that the institution is putting him in an impossible pedagogical situation to begin with by asking him to teach and assess 600 students? Right. I mean, I that seems like the real problem to me, not the fact that he's using, a, you know, an auto-graded multiple choice exam. I mean, yeah, obviously I, that's I, not I, ideal, but... Right. I think it's, I think, yeah, like I said, I don't want to cast any aspersions against Professor Quinn. But we can talk about the, the ideas in the abstract and just talk about what's going on there. And you're absolutely right. How could you even begin? Uh, he, it's impossible. You're using, you're using statistical models to try and determine understanding, you know, like, oh, I was watching the early returns coming in and, you know, they're a great point higher. I just, you know, at, on so many levels, that's so, <laughs> so complicated. I, just, I've taught classes with 50 students in it, and that was nearly a nightmare. I can't imagine trying to teach and assess 600 students. It's just... Right. Mind-boggling. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely mind-boggling. And he's talked about TAs and analysts and that kind of thing to assess understanding. Heidi, did you have something to say? Yeah, I, I wanted to say, so of those 200 students or so who took the time to go through those 700 questions and memorize them, 
there's got to be some learning happening in there somewhere, right? Right. I, mean, I know. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that was my thing. Is that je you know, instructors very frequently give exam review sessions or review sheets that are much shorter than that, that basically contain everything that's going to be on the exam. You know, I mean, in effect, you know, if you if you hammer that review sheet, you're going to get at least a B something. You know, you do all right. Um, right. Yeah, seven hundred questions. And you're only getting fifty, so I mean, yeah. you have to. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're going to know so fourteen to one or something like that is the ratio. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, fourteen to one. Yeah, I I mean, it's not that bad really. <laughs> if, yeah. if, if your people are mastering seven hundred questions, it's a win. Right, exactly. Unless yeah. there's, you know, some sort of yeah. way that students are, can refer back to those pages. But yeah. still, if it's the Xerox copy of 700 pages, right. just finding the, finding the questions is... You know, right. That's crazy. <laughs> and if, if the goal is student understanding, and the students did better by a full letter grade, isn't that a good thing? If that's your, if that's your assessment, you know, this is your ins an instrument. You have an exam they took. Yeah, they knew potential answers, but everybody knows potential answers. I don't know. It's just such a, such an interesting. Like, you really have to think about what are we trying to do here. You know, do we want students to come out on this bell curve where the you know B minus or so is average, or maybe a C plus, or would it be okay if every student got a hundred percent? Because you gave them fourteen hundred questions. You know, I mean, why not double it and say these are the questions. Study them. I don't know. I don't know the answer, but it, anyway, six, I, I agree with Madeira that 600 students in a lecture hall, thankfully, that's, that's not us in very many instances. Yeah. I spoke with a formal chemistry faculty member. I think he had 100 and nearly 200, um, and that's amazing to think about, you know, assessing that kind of understanding for that many people. But that's the reality of our world. And and I assume in in a class of that size, I I know classes, large classes at UAF, there there are TAs. So yeah, um, I I still would not think that a multiple choice test is a really good um, as as the sole measurement. Um, you have TAs, you should be using them and pushing them. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if if literally your midterm demonstration of understanding is fifty multiple choice questions. That's it, it can be okay, but there's certainly obvious room for improvement. Yeah. So uh, just we can jump back to my slides, unless either of you, as any, anybody else, has anything to jump in on that. I just it's interesting when you start to think about assessment. There's we make so many assumptions that the first thing you think when you watch that is, oh my God, people cheated on a, on a midterm at you know in in Florida somewhere. That's horrible. That's amazing. But if you start thinking about it. Well, I don't know. Okay. So uh, the way forward, if we're really to facilitate and foster student understanding, shouldn't all of our efforts be focused on assessing its full depth and complexity, complexity something that most summative assessments fail to accurately capture? On the other hand, this is where it just gets mind-bogglingly complicated. At, at some level, if we give students the infinite capacity to redo, if we scaffold them all the way through an assignment, are we coddling them? Maybe high stakes, coddled eggs, right? <laughs> Very nice. Uh, maybe high stakes is the real world. I mean, when you go to a job interview, it's a summative event. There's no scaffolding through that. Um, and a lot of the real world is, or is, is, is summative that way. Um, any thoughts on that? Is there is there room for extremely high stakes, winner take all assessment in college in the classroom? I I think there's a certain a, appeal to that for some students. Um, I know that was I was having a conversation with my um, daughter earlier, and I think that's almost a disappointing element of of the university experience to a certain extent. You expect it to be really really hard and really challenging. And sometimes it's just not, you know, yeah. and sometimes it's really nice to have somebody throw down the gauntlet, raise the bar, and say, how far can you actually go? Um, and I think it's a rare it's a rare professor who is willing to challenge students to that extent because they're risking having a bunch of students fail. 
Um, and so I don't think that that's a, a common experience, but for some students, I think that they might actually be looking for that. They might crave it. They might need it. They might need that kind of challenge. So yep. do we want everybody to assess people that way? Maybe not. But is there value in it? I think probably. Yeah, and there are different, it's, it's a cultural thing, right? There are different disciplines. Disciplines approach it differently. Uh, in English, we talked about you're more likely to find more formative type processes. In engineering, it's going to be more summative. You know, midterm, here you go. Can you do the math? Math is, you know, pretty, homework can be formative, but those big final, midterm, quarter, quarter final, whatever, those pieces are pretty summative. Um, you either know it or you don't. You don't um, get a lot of redos. Yeah, Kendall. Uh, so I came out of a master's program here at UAF. Um, and in the English department, and we had a comprehensive exam that was very much winner take all. Like you can't graduate from the program. <laughs> Madera knows it. Madera also did it um, without doing this exam, and you've got to read and be able to write intelligently for six hours about forty books, right? And so it is. It's very winner take all, and in some ways, um, very effective, right? Like you, you can risk not reading all the books and then you risk failing the exam. Um, yeah. It's a gateway assessment. It's a gateway assessment. The, to be yeah. honest, right, I think I was, someone, I was someone who read all the books and studied very hard and actually got out of that practice what the exam was intended to do, which was get you to read and think about these books and apply theories to them and then be able to demonstrate that. Yep. I was one of two people <laughs> out of the out of the fifteen that took it that year who did that, wow. um, and so about a dozen other people didn't even read half the books. And I know of people who read four and also passed the exam. So, um, which mm -hmm. is fine, right? Like to be honest, mm -hmm. it's like whatever. It, it's you know? fine. It's fine, except for interestingly, there are other gateway exams in other fields, like air traffic controllers. Yeah. Or pilots, or surgeons, or whatever. That it's not fine, yeah. because yeah. otherwise the field falls. Like it doesn't mean any. It becomes meaningless. So that's a really interesting. I think that's a fascinating so example. So it's a so it's a and test no. that's also. I think it like wasn't quite testing, right? It's like not quite testing what mm -hmm. it's meant to test, and at the same time going forward, right? Like the idea is that then. The idea is like if you're going to go into academia and then you want to be able to call on your knowledge of these books again, you know the books, but it's been. I don't know, three years since I took it, and I don't really know the books anymore. Um, and so there's this conversation about, well, why wouldn't, instead of having an exam, why wouldn't you have students take those 40 books and, you know, choose 15 and write, you know, like a literature review or something, right? Like, right. so it's, it's completely a part of this conversation, right? So, like, are you choosing an assessment tool that actually gets students to the outcome that you're aiming for, which is you know these books. To me, I think there's, this is again where failure to me is that there needs to be that threat of failure. If there's no threat of failure, if you know that even if you only read four of these books, you're probably going to be able to pass, that exam loses its value. And I wonder if there wasn't some kind of a cultural shift that went on between your stay there, Kendall, and mine, because two people failed it the year that I took it. Um, and they read a significant portion of that list. Um, but, you know, I mean, there, there are no stakes if there's no failure. I mean, that's, that's the stake. The stake is failure. And if, right. well, yep. if they're and not going to fail people, what's the value? Right. So that, that gets us back to this question, like, should our, should, when you ask the word should, it's very loaded, like, formative assessment can only get you so far. At some point, you need a high-stakes summative assessment to certify learning, to certify understanding. Because if you can never pass some sort of summative instrument that is, you know, where you demonstrate your understanding is, is deep and broad on your own, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not. I don't know the answer. I know some institutions and some programs, I, I, I've seen some, uh, not to pick on college liberal arts, but I've seen some masters of fine arts uh, portfolio demonstrations that are way stronger than others. Some are, you know, professional level amazing and others are not. Um, is that different than engineering where everybody meets a very strict level of co objective summative competency? I don't, I don't know. And it means different things from different institutions too. 
I, okay. I, I, oh, sorry. I was just going to throw one more thing in there. I, I think that some of that is related to the, and maybe I'm wrong about this. I'm kind of thinking out loud here, but it, it seems to me like the idea of subjective judgment has um, been devalued. So, like the, I mean, I think it's a problem that the CLA faces, right? So the judgment of somebody in the arts is it's a subjective judgment to a certain extent. Yes, there's yep. a there's there are certain criteria there, but they're not as cut and dry as in the math and sciences. Um, but that doesn't mean that that the experts, that the people in the position of doing the assessment, don't have valuable judgments to pass. Do you know what sure. I mean? And I think that that has mm -hmm. culturally, I think that we've stopped valuing subjective assessment. And I, I don't know if that's healthy. I, I agree with you, and I think the sciences and you know the the, the, the hard disciplines, if you will, have fallen back a little bit on the ease of assessing concrete understandings and walked away from some of the more subjective understandings that are actually what they really want students to know. We really want to know, can you formulate interesting new scientific uh, hypotheses? That's what science is about, right? It's not memorization of science content. That doesn't get science anywhere. It's not memorization of what's occurred before. It's can you put it together and synthesize and then ask questions that no one has yet asked. That's the power of science, but the, the, it's not assessed very, very frequently in science. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay, we're getting short on time. Um, I've only got a couple slides left. Um, let's see what we got here. So I just wanted to say um, these are the big questions I think that are really important to consider. What is assessment? It, it, the more you kind of explore and think about what it all encapsulates, it's a really complicated thing. For your own purposes, what are you assessing and why are you assessing that? Are you really interested in student learning, student understanding, or are you? do you have other motives? And that's fine. We all do. Um, but just being purposeful in creating your assessments. Um, if this seems daunting, that's fantastic because it really is for most of us, even for me. Um, we have weekly, uh, almost daily, open lab opportunities, both virtual and face-to-face. Um, you can find those at iteachu.uaf.edu slash events, um, linked from this slide, and this is a screenshot of today's event calendar. Um, we have a virtual open lab this afternoon starting at 1 o'clock, and we have uh, uh, Friday we have a 10 a.m. open lab that you can come to, um, and on and on throughout the summer. So please take advantage of, of us, uh, and we would really love to, uh, to help you and kick around these ideas of what's going to be great assessment for your courses because um, it's complicated and it's interesting and we enjoy that. Um, a reminder that there's the final course in this series, the final lecture or, or Hangout on Air is coming up uh, next week, July 6th. Um, and uh, other than that, thanks for coming uh, today and uh, thank you to my colleagues for joining in. I certainly appreciated your help. I'm, I'm hoping that any viewers greatly appreciated someone other than me talking. <laughs> yes, I know I did. So thank you for being here, and uh, thanks, Heidi, for putting this together. Thanks for yeah, having us, Owen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Owen. Thanks, Madeira and Kendall and Chris. Um, this, as Owen said, this whole recording will be available uh, after we're done here, and so you can go back to it, and the links are available on the resource site. So thanks for coming. <laughs>